If you've been watching our videos, you know that we cover a wide bunch of animated shows and movies, but they're usually on the lighter side concerning characters and story. Well, we wanted to change things up a little considering that Halloween was just around the corner and we didn't want to miss out on the fun. With that said, you better not be watching this alone in pitch black darkness, and in case you do get spooked, you can't say we didn't warn ya. And for those of you who love horror, you're gonna love this one. I'm Keegan with Channel Frederator, and these are 107 facts about Coraline. Number 1. The movie is based on Neil Gaiman's novel of the same name, which tells the story of titular character Coraline discovering a parallel world to hers behind a secret door in her new home with a dark, sinister secret. Because this isn't Narnia, where everything looks like it came straight from a fantastical dream and every animal talks. Though you might argue that there are some overlaps, but we'll let you be the judge of that. Number 2. The movie started to take on shape when its director, Henry Selick, met Neil Gaiman shortly after he had finished writing the book, and was invited to adapt it into a film. Number 3. Gaiman was a fan of Selick's work, who had history of directing stop-motion movies like The Nightmare Before Christmas, James and the Giant Peach, and Monkey Bone. Number 4. And that already tells you that this is a stop-motion feature, and the first project of this kind that had been produced by the stop-motion animation studio Laika, which would go on to produce a bunch of other stop-motion films like Paranorman, The Box Trolls, Kubo and the Two Strings, and more. Number 5. The movie's director, Henry Selick, joined Laika as a supervising director back when the studio was under its original name, Will Vinton Studios, when it was still struggling. Number 6. Because of this, the studio was forced to lay off several members of the crew and things weren't looking too good. Until Coraline. The movie ended up being a major success, receiving many award nominations and winning three Annie Awards for Best Music in an Animated Feature and Best Character Design and Production Design in a Feature Production. Number 7. Despite that, Selick left the studio in 2009, the year that the movie came out, due to an unsuccessful contract renegotiation, but Coraline's success story inspired the studio to shift gears to hone in more on stop-motion animation projects, resulting in more layoffs in its computer animation department. Number 8. The movie's score was composed by French composer Bruno Coulet, and marks his first score for an animated feature. He'd later go on to compose music for more animated projects, including Apple TV's Wolfwalkers. Number 9. While writing, Neil Gaiman was typing the name Caroline and along the way accidentally mistyped it as Coraline. The mistake eventually inspired the author into writing the novel, Coraline. Number 10. Throughout the film, the neighbors call Coraline Caroline, much to her annoyance. By the end of the film, everyone gets her name right, possibly an allusion to the previous fact. Number 11. As is common for any film adaptation, the film expands on the contents of the novel and introduces the character Wyborn YB Lovat, who does not appear in the novel. He was created so Coraline would not have to talk to herself and so she could have a friend her own age. Number 12. However, in the novel, Coraline is told about a family that used to live in the apartment complex she and her parents live in. That family's name was Lovat. Number 13. Initially, the film was going to be live action, and Dakota Fanning was actually going to physically portray Coraline. When it was decided instead to make a stop-motion animated film, Dakota was asked if she would still be interested in providing Coraline's voice. She said yes, as she thought it would be fun to do, and grew even more excited when she saw what Coraline was going to look like. Number 14. There are many key differences between Neil Gaiman's book and the movie. Most significantly, in the book, Coraline was much more suspicious and intelligent, and she could only go back and forth between the two worlds via the special door. In the movie, she is also shown just to wake up back at her real home without entering the door. Number 15. Coraline's parents had no names in the novel, whereas in the movie, they were given the names Charlie and Mel. Number 16. Coraline was the first stop-motion animated feature to be shot entirely in 3D. To capture stereoscopy for the 3D release, the animators shot each frame from two slightly apart camera positions. Number 17. With Coraline, Leica became the first company to do a feature-length movie using replacement faces printed from a 3D printer. Instead of ink on paper, 3D printing uses a UV-sensitive resin and support material that is sprayed down in a layering process that builds objects in 3D space. Number 18. A total of 1,500 replacement faces were created for all of the characters in the film, each one of which had to be hand sanded and hand painted. Coraline alone had over 6,300 face replacements. Number 19. 
the film required more than 70 character fabricators, puppet wranglers, armaturists, mold makers, character painters, costume designers, and fabricators and hair and wig fabricators. If that sounds like a lot, that's because it is. Number 20. There were 28 identical puppets of Coraline used in the making of the movie. Each one took 10 individuals 3 to 4 months to construct. The main Coraline puppet stood 9.3 to 9.4 inches tall. Number 21. The number of animators involved would peak between 30 and 35, and an additional 250 technicians and digital designers with an overall cooperation of up to 450 people working on the project. Number 22. During production, Leica Studios had students from the Art Institute of Portland help with the film in terms of sets and designs. Which makes sense, because if you're going to make a movie of this scale, you're gonna need all the help you can get. And since this is stop motion, you're gonna need an even bigger team than what would be needed for your usual animation feature. Number 23. On average, each animator completed anywhere from 2.22 to 6.52 seconds of footage per week. This translates to 90 to 100 seconds of overall finished animations each week. Number 24. Which is not a lot considering the movie had a runtime of 100 minutes. Selick, who also wrote the script for the movie, initially told Gaiman that he estimated a 47 minute long movie. Number 25. The jumping mouse circus sequence had as many as 51 carefully choreographed mice on screen at once, each needing to be replaced with a slightly different mouse 12 times for each second of film. In the end, over 650 different mice, or 6,000 separate parts, were created ranging in scales from 100 to 222%. Number 26. Completing the film involved over 500 people over 4 years, with 2 years of pre-production. Principal photography alone took 18 months. Number 27. Stop motion not only takes a long, long time as we've established, and an absurd amount of patience, but also lots of space. The movie was staged in a 140,000 square foot warehouse in Oregon, with the stage divided into 50 units that were separated by black curtains. Each unit contained a different set that was in the process of being dressed, lit, rigged, or shot, amounting to nearly 150 slots for staging. Among the sets were three miniature Victorian mansions, a 42-foot apple orchard, and a model of Ashland, Oregon, including tiny details such as banners for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Number 28. Though not mentioned by name, the setting of the film is Ashland, Oregon, which is the state where Leica Entertainment is based. The stage performers and performances in the movie are references to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival held in Ashland. Number 29. The Pink Palace's address bears the same numbers as the nondescript warehouse where the film was produced. Number 30. Raking in over 124 million in theaters worldwide, Coraline is the third highest grossing stop motion film of all time, after Chicken Run and Wallace and Gromit The Curse of the Were Rabbit. Number 31. A month before its release, in February 2009, a video game based on the movie was released by D3 publisher and developer Papaya Studio. The game features characters' voice lines, but only three of the actors from the movie reprise their roles. Dakota Fanning as Coraline, Keith David as the cat, and Robert Bailey Jr. as Wybor and YB Lovat. Number 32. Neil Gaiman says that out of all of the film and television adaptations of his books, Coraline is his favorite. Number 33. Crew member Althea Chrome was hired specifically to knit miniature sweaters and other clothing for the puppet characters, sometimes using knitting needles as thin as human hair. Small garments like Coraline's gloves took anywhere from 6 weeks to 6 months from conceptual design to finished product. Number 34. The art direction of the movie was inspired by the works of Japanese illustrator Tadahiro Uesugi whom Selick invited on board to become the movie's concept artist. Uesugi was initially hired for brief character work over a few weeks and eventually got a bigger role, working on the movie for over a year and being a big influence on the movie's contrasting color palette, which is muted in Coraline's real world and colorful in The Other World. Number 35. The Other Father has two different voice actors. John Hodgman provides his regular speaking voice, whereas John Linnell is the one that can be heard singing. Number 36. Linnell is part of the American alternative rock band They Might Be Giants, which is made up of him and bandmate John Flansburg. The two provided the music for the other father's song, which was one of the two out of the ten that they had written that was not cut. Number 37. 
The second song by the band can be heard in the movie's end credits. Number 38. The other mother is always humming one of the soundtrack songs while she cooks, among them the song Dreaming, which is the opening theme of the movie. Number 39. The choral pieces in the movie were sung by a children's choir in a nonsense language. The main soloist is coincidentally called Coraline. Number 40. As with any movie, you can't prevent scenes ending up on the cutting room floor. Among the deleted scenes was a scene in which YB tells Coraline that his grandmother's black, with the sweet ghost girl being his great aunt and Grandma Lovett's missing sister. There was also an altered version of the octopus facehugger scene in which Coraline's dad Charlie breaks wind after eating pizza, which was later changed into belching instead. Number 41. The latter of the two scenes actually remained in the movie, sort of. When Coraline's parents are tucking her into bed around the end of the movie, you can see a pizza stain on Charlie's shirt, likely a leftover from the deleted scene. This mistake was probably kept in because fixing it might have meant more effort than it was worth, especially in a stop motion feature. Number 42. Even 12 years after its release, there's still new people discovering the movie for the first time with existing demand. American home video and music company Shout Factory released a new Blu-ray edition of the movie in 2021. Number 43. Coraline has also been made into a stage musical, produced by MCC Theatre in New York, with music and lyrics by Stephen Merritt of the band The Magnetic Fields. Number 44. The movie has its own website, which comes with an interactive exploration game where the player can scroll through Coraline's world. In 2009, it won the Webby Award for Best Use of Animation or Motion Graphics. Number 45. The leaves in the scene where Coraline is returning to the well were created by spraying popcorn pink and cutting it up into little pieces. Number 46. Mr. Babinski is wearing the Russian hero medal for service at the Chernobyl nuclear disaster on April 26, 1986. The front reads, Participant in the Cleanup Campaign, and 4A3C indicates Chernobylskaya nuclear power plant. This medal is unique as it is the only medal in the world awarded for participation in a nuclear cleanup. Number 47. It's a popular theory that Mr. Babinski's skin color is a result of exposure to radioactivity, but according to the film's creators, his skin is blue from being outside in the cold all the time. Number 48. In the initial recording session, Don French played the role of Miss Spink and Jennifer Saunders played Miss Forcible. However, director Henry Selleck wasn't satisfied with the results, so he had French and Saunders switch roles and re-record their parts. These second recordings were used in the film, which might explain why the characters resemble the actress who did not provide the voice. Number 49. The two members of the Ramth Bros moving company that moves Coraline's family into their home are named for brothers Jerome Ramth and Joe Ramth. Both brothers did work on Nightmare Before Christmas with director Henry Selleck and also worked for Pixar Animation Studios. The mover at the front door, who's given the $1 tip, is modeled after Joe Ramth. Number 50. Near the end of the film, Coraline's father is seen reenacting the famous facehugger scene from Alien, using Coraline's stuffed squid. Number 51. The model of the father was based on Ted Raimi, brother of director and filmmaker Sam Raimi, who is best known for his Spider-Man trilogy starring Tobey Maguire. Number 52. When the other father is sadly playing one key on the piano, the sound is F sharp, but the key he's pressing is actually F. Number 53. The painting in the living room that Coraline calls boring, and that changes from the real world to the other world, resembles the work of artist Mark Ryden, who is known for bizarre imagery usually involving children. Number 54. The design of Coraline's ceiling as she dreams of the ghost children is reminiscent of Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. Number 55. The Detroit Zoo snow globe featured in the film contains a model of the Horace Racca Memorial Fountain, or the Bear Fountain sculpted by Corrado Parducci in 1939 as the centerpiece of the Detroit Zoo's reflecting pool. Number 56. Certain elements in the movie were made to look handcrafted. The flames were done with traditional animation and painted digitally, and the fog was dry ice. The snow was made from superglue and baking soda. Number 57. 1,300 square feet of fake fur was applied to stand in for live and dead grass. Number 58. Despite all the detail work, mistakes still happen. One such mistake occurs in the scene right before Coraline discovers the door. She drops her notebook, and in one frame you can see the wires holding it up. Number 59. 
When the other world begins to disintegrate, in the beginning the metal stairs leading up to the apartment of the other Babinski are missing, but they reappear shortly after. Number 60. The Fantastical Garden was the most complex set created for the film, featuring hundreds of handcrafted flowers, most of which had their own individual light sources. Number 61. All of the prominent plants seen in the other mother's beautiful garden are the same as the seed packets Coraline had aligned on the real-world windowsill near the beginning of the film, in the scene where she tells her real mother that she wants things growing when her friends come to visit. Number 62. The family photo of Coraline and her parents shows her hair with brown rather than her usual blue, implying that Coraline has dyed her hair before moving to the Pink Palace. Number 63. The Coraline puppet used for filming had 42 different wigs. Her hair was a special blend of three colors and was made of everyday hair products that included got-to-be glued hair cement and Garnier Fructis texture paste. Number 64. On the back of the moving van, there is graffiti on the bottom right corner that reads Stop Mo Rules. Stop Mo is short for stop motion. Number 65. The source novel is set in Neil Gaiman's native home of England. Although the film was altered to take place in the United States, voice actors Don French, Jennifer Saunders, and Ian McShane are all English. Number 66. The original sweater the design team had designed for Coraline's father sported a big maize and blue University of Michigan logo. However, producer Bill Mechanic decided to change the design in favor of his alma mater, Michigan State. Number 67. The red lighthouse in one of the snow globes that Coraline places on the shelf was modeled after Big Red, the lighthouse at the Holland State Park in Holland, Michigan. Number 68. When Coraline sees her friends in her photo from Michigan, she exclaims, My best trolls. The word troll is a common Michigan nickname for someone who lives in the Lower Peninsula. Number 69. Coraline is left-handed, as shown when she's writing down random things while exploring the house. Number 70. In a deleted portion of the table scene where Coraline's real father sings to her, he laments, I think I have a virus. Coraline's father is voiced by John Hodgman, perhaps more famously known as PC in Apple's I'm a Mac advertisements, where he often complains of being susceptible to viruses. Number 71. At different points in the film, Coraline is seen wearing a black baker boy hat with a symbol of a lotus flower on the front. In Greek mythology, the lotus eaters were a group of people that lived on an island dominated by a lotus tree. When the inhabitants ate the lotuses, they would completely forget their home and loved ones, and would want only to stay with their fellow lotus eaters, a theme that runs throughout the course of the movie. Number 72. Coraline is seen using a Leica M3 camera, the name of which is based on the movie's animation studio, Leica. Number 73. Coraline's parents drive a Volkswagen Beetle. The Leica studio where they produced and filmed the movie is located directly across the street from the Beaverton, Oregon Volkswagen corporate office. Number 74. The car model is also a nod to insects, many examples of which are seen throughout the film. The wallpaper in the living room of the Pink Palace is covered in beetle shapes that blend into the otherwise subtle floral design. Number 75. During the meal with the other mother, the welcome home cake features a double loop on the O in home, but not in welcome. According to graphology, a double loop on a lowercase O means that the person who wrote it is lying. There is only one double loop, meaning that she's welcome, but she is not home, implying the other mother is lying. Number 76. The other mother's name, Beldum, is an archaic word meaning malicious and ugly woman, which perfectly describes the other mother. In many stories, a Beldum closely resembles a spider and lures children into her home with candy and treats, only to trap them inside of a cobweb and liquefy their innards with venom. In other variations, Beldum just traps kids in her home and eats them, which can be found in the movie's plot. Just because you're adapting a children's book into film doesn't mean you can't borrow from other books, after all. Number 77. Towards the end of the movie, Coraline's real mother puts away a toy tank. The tank closely resembles the first ever tank, the British Mark I, nicknamed Mother. Number 78. During the first scene set in Coraline's bedroom, you can see that the photo frame containing the photo of her friends from back home is set on a stand in the shape of a praying mantis. This links to the praying mantis tractor that the other father drives later on. Number 79. Despite being Russian, the flag hanging outside of Mr. Babinski's apartment resembles the Montenegro flag. Number 80. 
Partway through the credits, behind-the-scenes footage of the mice swirling around the portal is shown, giving a look at the process of animating in front of the blue screen. Number 81. At the very end of the credits, the words, For those in the know, Jerkwad, appear on screen. This is a clue that could be used on the Coraline website in order to get an entry into a contest that ran during the movie's US theatrical run. Number 82. As Coraline explores the house, the shower scene from the movie Psycho is referenced as she pulls back the shower curtain and stabbing music plays. Number 83. The back of the chair where Coraline's doll sits features a small flower-shaped pattern. This small design is nearly identical to the one on the back of Jack Torrance's chair in The Shining, seen during one of his all-work-and-no-play writing sessions. Number 84. The movie has a bunch of references linked to director and writer Henry Selick. Number 85. The most obvious one is the face on the dollar bill given to the mover for a tip, showing the face of Henry Selick. Filmmakers will never run out of ideas to self-insert themselves into their projects. Number 86. Coraline's other father wears monkey slippers that resemble monkey bone, which was directed by Henry Selick. Number 87. When Coraline returns to the other world on the second night, she finds the other mother cooking dinner breakfast. The other mother cracks an egg, and the yolk is the head of Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas, which Selick also directed. Number 88. Henry Selick's son, George Selick, voiced one of the ghost children. Number 89. His other son, Harry, stepped in and provided the voice of Coraline's friend in Michigan, who spoke to her and can be seen in the picture frame. Number 90. The black hat that Coraline took from her suitcase and is seen wearing at one point in the movie is a Japanese schoolboy hat. The hat was based on a similar looking one that director Henry Selick had found for his son, who had no interest in it, and for some reason decided to give Coraline the same storyline, but he changed the ending because unlike his son, Coraline decides to wear the hat. I'm sure there are pseudo-psychoanalysts out there who will interpret this as parental projection, but, but that would go beyond the scope of this video. We found this one so strange that we kept it in. Number 91. When Miss Spink and Miss Forcible are introduced, we see framed placards of two shows they were in, the show's titles being a play on real existing plays by Shakespeare. The play Julius Sees Her is based on Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and the less clever spoof of King Lear is named after the play King Lear. Number 92. The Shakespeare references don't end there. During a trapeze act in The Other World, Miss Spink and Miss Forcible quote from Shakespeare's Hamlet. The words they speak are part of a speech that Hamlet gives to a pair of courtiers. Number 93. The doormat of Miss Spink's and Miss Forcible's says no whistling in the house. Whistling in a theater is considered bad luck. Number 94. While other Miss Spink is recreating the painting Ulysses and the Sirens by Herbert James Draper, which depicts a scene from the Greek myth, other Miss Forcible is recreating The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli, which shows the birth of the Roman goddess Venus. Number 95. There are 248 Scotty Dogs, or Scottish Terriers, in the audience with Coraline and YB watching the stage performance. Number 96. The sweater that the other mother makes Coraline is a reference to the story YB tells Coraline about falling into the well and seeing a sky full of stars in the middle of the day. Coraline is in a situation that is seemingly plain as day, yet her sweater represents being trapped in a situation much like being trapped in a well. Number 97. The strange object that Miss Spink and Miss Forcible give Coraline on her second visit to their apartment is an Adderstone. According to European mythology, Adderstones have magical powers, such as the ability to reveal witch disguises and traps by looking through the middle of the stone. Coraline does just this in the other world to find the ghost children's real eyes. Number 98. In the lightning strike scene, a lightning bolt in the shape of Beldum's true hand is visible. A little while later, when Coraline first goes to the actress's apartment downstairs, they read her tea leaves and see the hand once again. Miss Spink states that the hand means danger. Both of these scenes foreshadow the other mother's true nature. Number 99. This is also the case when the other father is singing his song to Coraline. He is attached to gloves which control what he does and makes him play the piano like a puppet. This mirrors the fact that the Beldum is in control of the other father and uses him like a puppet to lure Coraline into her false world. Number 100. If you pay attention to the song itself, the lyrics seem unobtrusive, when in reality he's warning Coraline about the other mother's motive. Number 101. 
At the end of the movie, as the camera zooms out from everyone in the garden, we can see the landscaping resembling other mother's true face as opposed to Coraline's like it was in the other world. Number 102. The three wonders the other mother makes for Coraline are references to the real world, as are what the other people become when the other world starts to fall apart. The other father becomes a pumpkin in the garden, a reference to the real father's job. The other Babinski simply becomes rats in a costume, a reference to the real Babinski's jumping mice. And the other Spink and other Forcible are represented as candy, reference to the real Spink and Forcible's taffy collection. Number 103. There are various little hints in the movie's background implying the fate of the missing children that had once lived in the Pink Palace. Most notably, there was the introductory scene of the doll resembling the ghost girl who was Grandma Lovat's missing sister. Number 104. There was also the painfully boring portrait Coraline discovers portraying an Edwardian-looking little boy eating an ice cream cone, resembling one of the other ghosts. And the silhouettes of the three ghost children are seen on the wall of the dining room in the other world as well. Number 105. The well that Coraline finds during her exploration of the Pink Palace is located in what resembles a fairy ring, which is a folkloric symbol indicating the presence of fairies. Stepping on or trespassing in the ring is said to come with bad consequences. Sometimes they can be linked with good fortune, such as a person being allowed to interact with and enjoy the company of fairies for a night. In the film, Coraline experiences both the good and the bad consequences of stepping in the fairy ring. At first, she's allowed to enjoy the pleasures of the other world, but soon she's in danger of being trapped there forever unless she fixes both her mistakes and the mistakes of the children who came before her. Number 106. There's only one major scene that occurs outside of the Pink Palace, which is when Coraline and her mom drop off Charlie and then proceed to go shopping for school uniforms. Producers originally wanted to get rid of the scene because they didn't like how it took them outside of the world that was created at the Pink Palace. However, director Henry Selick insisted on keeping the scene as it was. It was important to Selick to keep it because it was one of the final moments that Coraline and her mom have with each other before Coraline's parents go missing. The scene added a tension that was needed at that point in the movie, which the producers then realized after seeing the completed product. Number 107. In 2015, Laika held an auction called The Art of Laika, where the studio auctioned off various puppets and other pieces of material, such as set pieces and props that were used in their movies. The studio sold more than 250 items, generating more than 1 million in sales. Against expectations, the puppet of the other mother was the top seller and went for $50,000, and the puppet of Coraline in her blue sweater sold for about $24,000. Did you enjoy our list? What fact do you think we missed? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're there, like and subscribe to see more great videos every week. And remember, Frederator loves you.